You are listening to Artists on Art here at KZSC Santa Cruz. I am your host, Nada Milkovich. I have the, the utmost honor and privilege to be interviewing uh, one of our greats here in Santa Cruz, Ralph Abraham, worldwide great, really. Um, uh, Bolt from the Blue happened when you were born, Ralph, and I got to thank you so much for coming up to talk with me today. My pleasure. I got to get you the right. There we go. Ralph Abraham has uh, been here at UCSC since 1969. 1968. Excuse me, 1968 at the beginning of the university. Oh, uh, no. Six, begin, opened in 65. Oh, okay. So Every you year. A new college opened, College 1, 2, 3, 4. I arrived with the opening of College 4, now called Merrill College. M- right here. We're right here. Right uh, here. Very close by Merrill College. And you were brought in to help begin the mathematics program? Well, yeah, they were seeking to build the faculty in all departments. And that was a huge challenge because... A new university has very little appeal for established academics. So they, you know, recruited uh, nationally for people in every field, and uh, recruitment was organized by the colleges. Each year, a new college opened with a new person as provost who was promised that he or she could design an entire program So it was the college program, not the math department or the physics department, which, you know, did the recruiting. Ah, Because you came as a mathematician. You are a mathematician. I I am, yes. I came into the math department, but originally my office was in the college. As a core instructor? No. as uh, Every professor was associated to a college. Every college had a so-called faculty. Right. With uh, one or two people in each of several fields, and they were intended to organize a curriculum, not only the core curriculum, but a curriculum for a bachelor's degree in science, arts, or whatever, that would be individual to the college. So the newly appointed provost would travel around the country trying to recruit people who would then arrive in August with about 30 days to design a complete program and institute it for new students, so 800 students in coming to the new program. That was the idea. Of course, that's not what happened. <laughs> You're listening to Ralph Abraham talking about the beginnings of Merrill College here. Yeah, the beginning of UCSC, actually. Such an experiment, which was characteristic of the 1960s, which is our real subject here. We're in the 50-year anniversary of so many things. That's the first right. acid test. The, uh, that we celebrated so well here in Santa Cruz. There was a great party at Don Quixote's and yes. a bus stop that yes, commemorates bus stop. <laughs> on Soquel Road. And this year is the Aptos. 50th anniversary of Bookshop Santa Cruz. And was it last year that UCSC celebrated its 50th anniversary? And I was uh, in, invited to Merrill College for part of that celebration and saw so many of the original people who regathered in Santa Cruz from around the world. So 50 years is a good, is a good length of time. And uh, Santa Cruz has uh, survived as a hip city, as a university, and uh, probably not as the original UCSC was conceived that uh, faded away within 10 or 20 years. And Ralph is here to talk about his newest book called Hip Santa Cruz and its first-person accounts of the hip culture of Santa Cruz, California, here in the 1960s. It's been uh, selling out at the Santa Cruz at the Bookshop Santa Cruz. It's uh, it's a wonderful uh, celebration of the amazing people, a few of the amazing people that you have had relationships with for many years and who are um, have been interviewed. And the, you can read it. There's uh, how many people do we have here? Twelve people. Twelve people. It's a perfect number. Twelve numbers. Twelve uh, personalities, and they, some of them are are well known. Fred Mc, McPherson is, of course, well known, um, and some of them are not so much. And so it's been a real 
pleasure to be reading your book and to meet these people for the first time, such as Pat Bisconti, Rick Gladstone, Max Hartstein, Peter Demma, Bob Hall, Judy Hill, Leon Tabary, Joe Lizowski, which I hope we'll talk a little bit more about, and Rivka Barmore. And so these are the people that you were able to get um, interviews with, and some of them are, are already written articles. Um, how long have you been writing this book? Uh, well, I didn't write the book. As well, you putting it to you, right? It, yeah. <laughs> um, this book is extracted from a website, which has been an uh, ongoing project for 14 years. Most of the activity in the early years, so 2002, 3, 4, and 5, the idea then was to record these stories of the early days of Santa Cruz um, before the people passed. And by now of the 12 people, five of them actually have passed away. So these um, stories cover the first couple of years of uh, this uh, amazing creative moment uh, and major cultural transformation that took place in Santa Cruz. I wanted to get these stories uh, before either the people forgot or they passed away. And uh, the individuals are little known and the stories also had not been told anywhere. There are, of course, a few uh, newspaper clippings that you could find in the archives somewhere so uh, I, I started the project of recording these people. I rented a space. I bought a fancy audio recorder. I interviewed some of the people multiple times, and the audio recordings were then transcribed and published on the website, which is called the Hip History Project, Santa Cruz Hip History Project. And that website was and remains the outcome of the history project. And there are many more interviews than, uh, and also photographs, uh, audio recordings, videos, and all kind of um, detritus from the 1960s, particularly the years 1964 to 1970. That's I defined as the beginning and the end of this cultural experiment. You're listening to Ralph Abraham talk about his newest book, Hip Santa Cruz. This is a book that um, has been being created for the last 16 years, but there's stories from that time period. And some of the hippest people that you met at that time is who are the people you invited in, right? Well, yeah. There are more important people involved that I never met, so I didn't <laughs> interview them, or they didn't come forward to be interviewed, or they attended our meetings, which were called story circles, uh, but chose to keep silent. So I, I did what I could to get the stories, and there was, in my opinion, a certain places that were the important nodes of a complex dynamical system, basically, a social network. And uh, I particularly focused on the individuals who c created these institutions, uh, the Catalyst, the Hip Pocket Bookstore, the barn and the 20th century ensemble. Those four places were were very important centers <clears throat> in this uh, chemical reaction that that produced Hip Santa Cruz. When when you say <clears throat> systemic, uh, Ralph Abraham, you're talking uh, on a on a bigger systemic kind of definition than most people um, think about. Uh, having been um, a chaos theorist for many years. And uh, when, you, when you say system and uh, these nodes that perhaps um, create a pattern in the chaos, can you, would, would you just talk a little bit more about that? Well, yes. Well, system is one of those very overused words. And uh, everything you think of associated with that word is actually a true meaning of that word. Um, but I use the word more as um, official mathematical jargon. And so um, in chaos theory, also known uh, dynamical systems theory, a, chaos, a, a complex dynamical system is the main object of study. 
and uh, that means you have a dynamical system. So that's a um, a thing which is changing state, a state which can be measured in some mathematical way according to um, deterministic rule, and it orbits around like uh, planets going around the sun. That's a dynamical system. So a complex dynamical system is another use of the word system, and it means you have a bunch of these dynamical systems which are connected up so that the state of one uh, influences the state of another one. And uh, so when in management science, for example, you study organization, organization is a complex dynamical system in which there are nodes, so-called, those uh, special th systems which are or subsystems that are connected up. Those uh, nodes might be um, political parties or churches or um, the finance department, uh, the police department, the fire department, and so on. Each one affects other ones um, and comprises a kind of a network which you could you could model with uh, tinker toys. So you connect up um, golf balls with uh, toothpicks, more or less, and you put a toothpick between two golf balls whenever they actually communicate and influence each other. Otherwise, no toothpick, you see. And uh, since each one of these nodes is dynamic, that is to say, changing rapidly according to rule, then the whole complex or network or matrix is also changing in this uh, complicated way. That's a complex dynamical system. So world cultural history, for example, is the biggest complex dynamical system. Or the, um, the politics of the United States, where you have the two parties, and then you have the additional parties, and then you have the pollsters, and then you have the media, and so on. The media affect the polls, affect the media, affect the voters, and, and uh, these complex dynamical systems can be studied mathematically by a method involving computer simulation, where the computer simulates the entire network, and this is used to uh, predict future behavior of the complex system. So Nate Silver might say that Hillary is going to win by 56% or something like that. These uh, predictions are based on uh, not the mathematics, but the human interpretation of the experience of watching the simulation because of chaos theory, the future behavior of complex dynamical system is not determined. You know, so the predictions are uh, like uh, weather forecasts can never really be trusted. <laughs> Ralph Abraham, uh, thank you for that great definition of systems. And I want to say how much I appreciate your ability to take a mathematical concept and apply it to the world, like you were just exam um, giving us the examples of. Um, I had the pleasure of being able to see you speak about, you called it the, the bolts from the blue, and they were over a long history of humanity, let's say 40, 50, 60,000 years of history, and where you see uh, these perhaps nodes that um, bring up the entire uh, understanding of the world in culture. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? And um, this is all leading up to <laughs> Santa Cruz. <laughs> well, I, I, I have these various uh, books I've written, um, maybe not including this one, but I call them my uh, non-mathematical books. And one, for example, uh, called Chaos Gaia Eros, is an, a, an attempt to describe world cultural history. But what's the point? I'm not a historian, and in fact, my knowledge of the, the infinitely large volume of data about world cultural history is is very, very modest. But the thing is, each person sees history, even their own history, from their own perspective. And my perspective is that of chaos theory. Chaos theory sees history differently. And maybe this different view is of interest to some people. One of the uh, main f uh, f focus of chaos theory are these so-called bifurcation moments. That is when the behavior of the system 
undergoes a instantaneous change to a completely new behavior in world cultural history these uh, moments there, there are quite a few of them and <clears throat> they're not usually the focus of attention so in in my view in chaos Gaia eras for example i see world cultural history is a 50,000 years worth or 100,000 years divided into different epochs and what is of special interest to me is the bifurcation moment the catastrophic transformation from one kind of behavior or world system uh, to another. So in that view, I have looked at the history of Santa Cruz in the 1960s from uh, the chaos theory point of view. And according to me, there is this major bifurcation or cultural transformation before and after the, the onset of hip culture. And there's another one, maybe, when hip culture disappeared. So this bifurcation, um, you also use the term miracle. Yes. Would you mind describing your definition of miracle? Well, um, when there's a major catastrophe, like uh, explosion of Mount Vesuvius and destruction of a city, or this um, mega fires like we're having now, a couple of them in California, uh, these are major transformations, and we do not call them miracles. So um, the, the word miracle kind of suggests something good, like somebody was sick, and then they were cured by a miracle drug. So uh, in my perspective, uh, ills of society were cured by a miracle drug in the 1960s. Would you care to name the miracle drug? Well, it's usually called LSD. <laughs> uh, maybe we could even use like a more broad term, uh, the psychedelic movement? Absolutely, yes, you could. Um, the, the, the psychedelic movement, uh, of course, began 30 to 50,000 years ago or maybe longer. And different uh, naturally occurring substances were uh, consumed or somehow prepared and used by inhalation, by eating, by rubbing on the skin or whatever, by uh, shamans or special uh, spiritual leaders in cultures over the time. And I, I think uh, th there's an official theory of some people, Terence McKenna is one in his book, uh, Foods of the Gods, that the bifurcations the major cultural transformations in world cultural history were each and every one of, one of them precipitated by the ingestion of a new psychoactive substance. Ah, and hence LSD. LSD, of course, is a synthetic one, like what happened. Uh, LSD is a natural, naturally occurring substance. Uh, but what happened after its uh, synthesis by Alfred Hoffman in the 1950s that it became available and distributed in massive quantities, and therefore its effect on world cultural history was more massive, more global, and more sudden than anything that ever happened before. It's fascinating. You're listening to Ralph Abraham talk about using his lens, Chaos Theory, to look upon the world, and uh, also his book, Hip Santa Cruz. His book is actually a collaboration with uh, all the people that he interviewed and was able to get transcribed and into this book. Yes, I'm just the editor. You're just the editor, the, the, the person who brings them together. My royalty share is 5%. <laughs> Would you say you were the catalyst? Uh, I was a, a, a catalytic agent but I was actually precipitated by other catalysts, people who egged me on to do this. I'm the one who decided to accept the assignment. Wonderful. And we're back. This is Artists on Art, and you're listening to KZSE Santa Cruz. We're having a great conversation with Ralph Abraham. Dr. Ralph Abraham came to uh, UCSC, in 1968, and he has been here ever since. He continues to teach, even though he is retired, and he's teaching a beloved class out of Porter College, I believe. Are you still doing that? Yes. Oh. And he is here to talk about his newest book, Hip 
Santa Cruz. This is a, a wonderful book that is first-person accounts from the pioneers of hip culture here in Santa Cruz in the 1960s. Many, many who were Ralph's friends. Um, he started this project in around 2000, um, and it's called Hip San- Santa Cruz Hip History Project. Santa Cruz Hip History Project dot com. Uh, no, the website is um, it's in part of my website, ralph-abraham.org. Okay, ralph-abraham.org. You'll be able to see the, the myriad of projects that Ralph has been doing over the years, both as a mathematician and educator, as well as a um, writer and um, creator of this uh, first-person account. Santa Cruz Hip Culture Project. And so we were talking about the lens at which uh, Ralph looks at the world through um, and and describing how uh, culture has changed over the years. And I know that there are many, many um, videos that you can see on YouTube with Ralph in conversation with Terrence McKenna, talking about how psychedelia had influenced uh, world culture and changes in humanity. And you consider the late 60s and Santa Cruz as one of those uh, bifurcation moments that you were describing. And there were four venues that you talked about that were locations that brought together uh, many of these extraordinary thinkers. Um, And so... I was wondering if we could talk a bit about uh, the different places, such as the barn and the hip pocket bookstore. Yes. Uh, And the 25th Century Ensemble and the the Catalyst. So these uh, four places, and there were many others, including uh, communes, where not only people lived communally, but also provided some kind of educational or transformational service for other communes. Uh, so the first of these that's featured in the book, uh, Hip Santa Cruz, I think the first one is called the Hip Pocket Bookstore. That's right. The Hip Pocket Bookstore uh, was created as an intentional cultural transformational act uh, by two people called Peter Demmer and Ron Bevert. And the idea then in 1964, I think, preceded the World Wide Web, which started only 30 years later. So at that time, uh, intellectual um, information, um, transformational efforts, uh, spiritual um, education, it was conducted with uh, books. And um, there's still more books published than ever before, but I don't know how many people read them compared to referencing the World Wide Web. But in the 1960s, creating a bookstore could be a transformational experience for an an entire town or a county or a state. So Peter Demme and Ron Bevert, they wanted to do something um, to transform world cultural history, really, with an intentional act on a very small scale in a certain place, which was viewed to be a a fecund, a fertile place for the implanting of a certain seed, which could then sprout into a gigantic tree and spread over the entire globe. So they conceived the Hip Pocket Bookstore. The Hip Pocket Bookstore had uh, art objects, including paintings, photographs and sculptures and it had a collection of books which were like Henry Miller you know books that were intended to transform an entire society and they <clears throat> pooled their li- very limited c- c- capital they invested in a m- small inventory they rented a venue on Pacific Avenue which is now part of the St. George Hotel, which was at the time part of the St. George Hotel. And they planned the opening of the bookstore as 
a, a big splash that would be their statement of this is this is what we're doing is called the hip pocket bookstore because hip means hip is for them then a new idea this is going to be you know they're inventing hip whereas previously it had been beat people had a transformation in which they were formerly beat and after the transformation they became hip so they're almost defining the word with the name of the bookstore the hip pocket bookstore a play on the hip pocket which means on your hip the pocket on your hip where a, a pocket book is one that you could put in your pocket. A hip pocket book is one you could put in your hip pocket. And in enough people carry around truly revolutionary material in their hip pockets, you see, then in no time at all, society would be transformed. This is the concept. So the opening, am I carrying on too long about this? No, not at all, Ralph Abraham. (laughs) (coughs) Well, probably... It's hard to find the details on this uh, to read, even in my own book. So uh, there was a very influential artist behind this movement called Ron Boise. Ron Boise lived in a bread truck in Big Sur, and he made uh, sculptures of metal. The metal had to be reclaimed usually from uh, wrecked automobiles, uh, recycled steel and bronze uh, welded into these sculptures. And um, he had uh, miniatures and uh, life-size and gigantic sculptures that he he made with his uh, welding apparatus. And among them was a series called the Kama Sutra series. And these were... Uh, about sexual positions involving uh, two adults. So Peter Demo and Ron Bevert thought of featuring the sculptures of Ron Boise, who was already known. His sculptures were shown locally and in San Francisco and so on. Um, as the chief characteristic feature of the opening of the Hip Pocket Bookstore, so they uh, took two large uh, sculptures from the Kama Sutra series and mounted them over the entrance to the store and covered them with a sheet and invited the mayor of Santa Cruz to do the formal opening of the new store, during which speech the sheet would be pulled away, revealing this uh, slightly sexy sculpture, it's an exaggeration to call them pornographic, but nevertheless, it did galvanize, which maybe they had predicted to a certain extent, a gigantic and negative response on the part of different nodes of the complex dynamical system of uh, the city of Santa Cruz. Con- so, conservative nodes, you might say? Conservative nodes, and uh, and groups that were revolutionary in some ways, but not uh, in, in this way. So there was a, a court case, and I think the local judge ruled in in favor of uh, the First Amendment or something. Uh, and and so the, the store was vindicated, and it did have a huge splash, and everybody knew about this store, and many people went there to read the books without buying them and uh, to smoke dope around the corner and to discuss everything revolutionary. It was a center for discussion and cultural change. It was an educational institution. It preceded the opening of UC Santa Cruz. It was fundamental, uh, crucial, germinal for the evolution of hip culture worldwide right here in Santa Cruz. Would you be? Um, would you say that this is where the hippies were born? The hippie concept. Well, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. We have to do some research on that subject. But I mean, it, it, it's 1964. Was, say, How many people were using the word hippie? And the hippies were more like the summer of love. This is where the hippies all came out yeah. to Golden Gate. This was, I think, one of the early and uh, uh, crucial centers for the propagation of this new idea. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Right here in Santa Cruz. 
We should be proud, and we are. You're listening to Ralph Abraham, professor of mathematics here at UCSC. He is retired, but he still comes out and teaches one quarter a year, would you say? One quarter a year. One course a year. One yes. course a year. Yeah. And the course that you're teaching... Are this My favorite course uh, that I teach every year is called Chaos, Fractals, and the Arts. And it combines art history, uh, chaos mathematics, and computer programming, computer graphic pro- programming especially, in order to create a work of art that incorporates mathematical concepts. Uh, so each year I offer the course, it has a different content. Would you mind if we talked a little bit about the barn? The barn. The barn. <coughs> well, the barn was a creative idea of an individual called uh, Leon Tabori, uh, who, like Peter Demma, has also uh, passed away. And he's in the book. Leon Tabori is in the book, yes, yes, because I recorded uh, four lengthy interviews with him long before he passed. And Peter Demma. And Peter Demma. So uh, Leon Tabori was born in Lithuania in an Orthodox Jewish family and uh, in his teen years was swept up in World War II and incarcerated in Dachau where his uh, family uh, was all killed. But uh, he survived. And at the end of the war, Dachau was liberated. And uh, his cousin who had emigrated to the United States and was in the U.S. Army, was part of the liberating force. So this uh, extraordinary coincidence led Leon Tabori, uh, gave him the the way to emigrate uh, to the United States. And then he went to college in Chicago, I think, and he uh, became a psychoanalyst, and he moved to California, He became the prison psychologist at San Quentin, where Neil Cassidy, an important uh, prankster, uh, beat and early hip author, was incarcerated for possession of marijuana. And Leon Tabori and Neil Cassidy became friends. Then Neil Cassidy was released from prison and with his family moved to a house in Los Gatos where Leon Tabori ended up living also. He expanded his uh, psychoanalytic practice to Santa Cruz. For the one or two days a week, he would travel from Los Gatos to Santa Cruz. And then he happened to, uh, to get involved in the Hip Pocket Bookstore. Leon Tabori, from his background of transformation, I mean, World War II was extraordinary, Uh, not so much appreciated in this country, but in in Europe, people understand this is a gigantic bifurcation or cultural transformation in Europe, which reverberations continue today in the immigration policies of the EU and so on. Leon Tabori got the idea to... Uh, create a center for transformation that would be a social center in which the, the arts would, uh, would flourish in creating an environment, a transformational environment from his perspective as a psychotherapist. And so he rented uh, the, the barn, a large building in Scotts Valley, And uh, two painters were involved in decorating it, Pat Bisconti and Joe Lozowski, uh, both of whom have contributed to the book, uh, Hip Santa Cruz. And they made, uh, there were fluorescent, there was a large dance hall, basically, with fluorescent paintings and black lights uh, in a room otherwise dark so illuminated by these colors. And uh, music was played by different groups. For example, uh, uh, Janis Joplin and Country Joe and the Fish, they performed in the barn was among their earliest performances. So you had this phenomenal music, some of it very spacey. Uh, for example, the Sons of Eternity 
played musical instruments that were sculptures made by Ron Boise, which was like large thing, like a stand-up bear where there's holes you put your arms inside and piano strings are rigged there so you could pluck it like a harp. So this eerie music and, and up to 300 people under the influence of various psychedelics were dancing to this uh, spooky music among the spooky paintings, and it was Leon Tabori felt this was an environment that could transform a culture, and it did. Therefore, it <clears throat> brought forward a gigantic backlash, of course, as did the Hip Pocket Bookstore. They've survived for a few few, few years, and then, uh, like the Hip Pocket Bookstore, collapsed under the influence of negative cultural forces. You mentioned earlier in the show, Ralph Abraham, about these moments of cultural transformation and bifurcation that um, revolutionize what's happening before to what's happening after. And you talked a little bit about what was the what was the big need for revolution in the late '60s. What what was it that needed to be removed or changed? Well, everything. We lived in a very repressive culture. And maybe it's easier to talk about today because of the 1960s, 50 years ago. Uh, today, many people believe <clears throat> that our society is on a death track, really. It's like a, a freight train roaring up to a cliff over which it will go over like lemmings. Uh, because of environmental problems, because of population explosion, because of disastrous and greedy economic uh, structures like capitalism or whatever. And this, according to this pessimistic view, there is uh, no escape. People have tried, like over a hundred years, people have been trying to steer the train somehow to get it away from that cliff. Um, so by now, it appears like we've tried everything and nothing has worked. So are we doomed? No, because maybe there could be a miracle. Well, there have been miracles in the past without which we wouldn't be here now. Our species would have disappeared long ago like, like, like dinosaurs. So um, miracles have happened, everybody agrees. But it's not so clear that we could expect one now. So I think the history of the 1960s is so important because there was a miracle then within living memory. People my age and a little bit younger have seen, have experienced personally a major cultural transformation in which a kind of a love energy came through a split in the sky and illuminated the darkness everywhere, at least for a few years. And that it w was possible. We know it's possible because we experienced it. And you know what? We could use another one today. So when you talk about the repression, it, uh, the reason I ask is I, I think that there's a lot of young people that, you know, take a lot for granted and see the world as pretty liberal that we live in this bubble here in Santa Cruz. Um, but it hasn't been like this all the time. And there had to be a pretty big change um, that happened before and then. Would you mind just describing a little bit what that repression was like? Well, just take tobacco, for example. So nowadays, uh, tobacco is uh, available. Somehow it's restricted a little bit. Um, a minority of people smoke tobacco. But 50 years ago, almost everybody smoked tobacco. You look at old movies. They're kind of puffing away on cigarettes everywhere, and the only exception would be puffing on a pipe. So tobacco smoking could be seen as a kind of a, a liberty or freedom. We're free to smoke tobacco. Like, and we're not free to smoke marijuana. But it wasn't a freedom, it was actually a repression because the 
intelligence, the information to make an informed decision to smoke or not smoke was denied us by repressive forces that repressed the medical research showing the connection between tobacco and cancer. So uh, there were so many repressions, and we have been liberated one at a time. We got um, uh, like gender uh, liberation is something that happened after the hip movement in the 1960s. Uh, my book is all full of men because there were women involved and they were oppressed by the men. In general, it was a very sexist culture. But within a couple of years of the breakthrough of hip culture, we had the women's liberation movement. Again, in Santa Cruz, was very, very forefront in the, the whole world movement of women's liberation. Uh, then uh, gays, lesbians, etc. also. Santa Cruz was a, a, a center where lesbians were coming from all over the world to Santa Cruz in the 1970s. So now young people that take this uh, for granted, we can uh, buy marijuana legally, we can uh, do this and that. We have not gender equality, but we have made big progress. There's gay marriage. I mean, it's unbelievable the liberations that have happened within 50 years, and I believe they are stacked up in a domino effect of one change leading to another. Oh, they got their rights. Maybe we could get ours. And so the precipitation of the big one in the early 1960s has led to all these things that we now take for granted. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Oh. It's so wonderful to, again, to have a chaos theory lens look upon how our society has changed, specifically here in Santa Cruz County. And I invite um, my dear audience to take a look at HIP Santa Cruz. The first person accounts of the HIP culture of Santa Cruz, California in the 1960s. This was uh, a collaboration and um, brought together by Ralph H. Abraham. You can also go online to ralph-abraham.org and find um, where the project actually began before it got out here in print. I know it's available at the bookshop Santa Cruz. Where else would this be available? Logos. And Logos. And Amazon. And Amazon. Um, HIP Santa Cruz. Uh, just the one of many books by Ralph Abraham, and this one I think is uh, very appropriate for Santa Cruz because, as you mentioned earlier, Ralph, you've given us a glimpse in to people that might be forgotten otherwise, and uh, where it's here in my hand. And I thank you so much. Yeah, it makes me furious that names like Peter Demma and Joe Lozowski and Leon Tabori are unknown. Well, I think when they deserve so much. You're changing that, Ralph. <laughs> you're making that happen. And uh, I thank you for all of your work, and especially as the great professor that you are and all of the, the people that you've touched with and your thank work. you, Nada, for bringing me in. Oh. Um, I want to thank you for listening, my dear audience. I want to thank Vanya Benavides for live tweeting and Facebooking during the show. And I invite you all to stay for Moon Majun, because you know what? This is the psychedelic music that begins on Wednesdays and continues on through with the Golden Road. So we're going to hear some wonderful music. And uh, one final thank you to Ralph Abraham. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. <laughs>